right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Earlier this morning, we issued a statement expressing the Secretary General's concerns about the unfolding situation in the Maldives, in particular, the declaration of a state of emergency and the entry of security forces into the Supreme Court premises. The Secretary General urges the government of the Maldives to uphold the Constitution and rule of law, lift the state of emergency as soon as possible, and take all measures to ensure the safety and security of the people in the country, including members of the judiciary. Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs Miroslav Yencha spoke today by phone with the Foreign Minister of the Maldives, Dr. Mohamed Dasim, and reiterated the Secretary General's serious concern about the unfolding situation in the country, in particular, the arrest of the Chief Justice earlier today. Mr. Yencha stressed the importance of upholding the Constitution and the rule of law, in particular, the need to preserve the independence of the judiciary. He urged the government of the Maldives to release the Chief Justice and Supreme Court judges urgently. Mr. Yencha also called on the Foreign Minister to take all necessary measures to ensure the safety and security of all people in the country and to resolve the, cri the political crisis through all party talks, which the UN stands ready to facilitate. The UN resident and humanitarian coordinator and the UN representatives in Syria today call for an immediate cessation of hostilities lasting for at least one month throughout Syria to enable the delivery of humanitarian aid and services, evacuation of the critically sick and wounded, and alleviation of people suffering to the extent possible. The United Nations humanitarian team in Syria warns of the dire consequences of the compounded humanitarian crisis in several parts of the country. In Afrin, the uh, ongoing military operations on the one hand and the reported blockage of exits by other forces on the other hand have virtually trapped many civilians, preventing them from accessing safer areas. So far, 380 families have reached surrounding villages and Aleppo city neighborhoods, while thousands of people have been displaced within Afrin. As the fighting escalates, the number of civilians affected by violence is bound to increase. In Idlib, the military operations resulted in increased casualties in movement of civilians to safer areas. Some of them have been forced to move several times to escape fighting. We have more details online. Emergency fuel for critical facilities in Gaza will become exhausted within the next 10 days. The acting UN humanitarian coordinator for the occupied Palestinian territory, Roberto Valent, warned today. The UN office in Gaza says that there is an urgent need for donor support to avoid a humanitarian catastrophe driven by the energy crisis. At present, the nearly 2 million Palestinian residents of Gaza, over half of whom are children, receive electricity for no more than eight hours each day. This year, $6.5 million is required to provide 7.7 .7 million liters of emergency fuel. This is the bare minimum needed to stave off a collapse of services. Mr. Valent said that hospitals have already begun to close. Without funding, more service providers will be forced to suspend operations over the coming weeks, and the situation will deteriorate dramatically, with potential impacts on the entire population. There are more details online. And in line with that, we also have an appointment to announce. Today, the Secretary General is announcing the appointment of Jamie McGoldrick of Ireland as Deputy Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, UN Resident Coordinator and Humanitarian Coordinator for the Occupied Palestinian Territory. He succeeds Robert Piper of Australia, to whom the Secretary General is grateful for his commitment and dedicated service. Mr. McGoldrick brings extensive experience in humanitarian affairs, international cooperation, economic development, and political affairs. Most re recently, you will remember he served as UN Resident Coordinator and Humanitarian Coordinator in Yemen. We have much more in a bio note in our office. The UN Refugee Agency and its partners are today launching a funding appeal for $391 million to support some 430,000 Burundian refugees during 2018. Low levels of humanitarian funding for this crisis remains a great concern. Burundian refugees could get a mere 21% of the required funds, making it the world's least funded refugee response plan. Since 2015, more than 400,000 refugees and asylum seekers have fled the country, escaping human rights abuses, continued political uncertainty, and the related humanitarian crisis. Refugee numbers are expected to increase by over 50,000 this year, as regional efforts to resolve the political crisis in the country have not made significant progress. Tanzania is hosting the largest number of Burundians, followed by Rwanda, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Uganda. At this stage, UNHCR and partners are not promoting or encouraging refugee returns to Burundi, and remind states that refugees should not be forced to return against their will. 
The UN Refugee Agency also expressed today grave concern about escalating violence in Ituri province of Northeastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, creating new displacement over the last four days. At least 30 people are reported to have been killed amid conflict between the Hema and Lendu ethnic groups, and many villages have been burnt to the ground. Fighting among the two communities had previously devastated the region from 1999 to the early 2000s, leading to large-scale internal displacement and refugee movements to Uganda. Now UNHCR offices on both sides of the border are once more on high alert, with initial reports putting the number of internally displaced in the thousands. In total, some 5 million people have been displaced by conflicts in the DRC. Today is the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation. In his message for the day, the Secretary General says this, that said that this practice is a gross violation of the human rights of women and girls. He said that while progress has been achieved in many countries, further political engagement is needed to prevent some 68 million girls from being subjected to female genital mutilation by 2030. With the dignity, health, and well-being of millions of girls at stake, there's no time to waste. Together, we can and must end this harmful practice, he added. And UN Women also just announced the appointment of activist Jaha Dukare as regional goodwill ambassador to support its advocacy to end female genital mutilation and child marriage in Africa. You can find more information on this online. And for the honor roll, thanks today go to Cyprus and Kuwait, both of which have paid their regular budget dues in full for 2018, and the honor roll now totals 40. And with that, are there any questions? Yes. Sure. I, some other things, but I, I wanted to know, I, I was looking at the Secretary General's schedule today, and it says everything is internal, and I understand that he's leaving today for the Olympics, but um, Code Blue has said that he's meeting today with uh, Michelle Sibide of UNAIDS. I don't know if that's true, and they, they're urging him to, to provide more transparency on the reported uh, clearing of uh, Louise Louris uh, on sexual harassment charges. So I wanted to know the two things. Number one, I've, I've tried to ask before, but given that, that uh, pretty prominent group in this field has said that it's not to, to simply, uh, they claim that Mr. Civide basically unilaterally uh, uh, dismissed the case. And so how was the decision made within UNAIDS and is it true that, the, as they say, that Mr. Guterres is meeting with Michelle Civide today? Uh, actually, the Secretary General right now, as we're speaking, uh, should be leaving uh, uh, for the Republic of Korea. So they're uh, already starting on a plane flight. In the, in the morning, he just had internal meetings. I do not believe he met Mr. Sidibe uh, prior to his departure from headquarters. Does uh, he have, okay, go ahead. Uh, and he, uh, he obviously doesn't have any, me any meetings scheduled now sure, because sure. he's going, he's on the airplane. Uh, beyond that, um, from the moment the complaint was received by the UNA's executive director, it, it was immediately referred to the Office of uh, Internal Oversight uh, of the World Health Organization. And uh, investigation was underway after that time and has, and has just been uh, completed. That was the procedure that UNAIDS follows. It goes to the World Health Organization's internal oversight. But does the, does the director of UNAIDS, Mr. Michelle Sibide, then make a final determination, or is it entirely whatever the recommendation of OIOS of WHO is, is taken? Uh, it, has, it has to follow the recommendations by the investigators, in other words, by the World Health Organization investigators. But beyond that, you'd have to check with, uh, with UNAIDS. Uh, we can't speak to the case um, uh, in, in its detail because it wasn't handled by the UN Secretariat. Uh, however, the Secretary General does expect the case to be thoroughly investigated. As you know, UN entities outside the Secretariat have their own rules that set out the terms of conditions of employment for its staff, including a code of conduct. And the Secretariat does not have jurisdiction over these cases. Uh, at the same time, the Secretary General is aware that the, the rules, regulations, and investigative practices across the UN system need to be, uh, need to be brought in line. And he's taken measures to address this. So just one of the final thing, when he, when he said at the stakeout that he's declaring zero tolerance, does he only mean for the Secretariat, or does it no, extend no, throughout no, since he, means, he said that he, they have their own he rules? He means throughout the system, and this is something he's tried to make clear. Yes. Farhan, just to clarify, so this case is still under investigation. Uh, you would have to check with uh, UNAIDS how, how the, what, whether there's any final determination. As far as we're aware, the investigation has just been completed. And uh, now it's up to them to determine what follow-up steps are to be taken. It's, it's up to UNAIDS. Uh, like I said, uh, the Secretary General is trying to make sure that the various standards of, of the UN system can be brought into line. Uh, 
because, of course, uh, for, for obvious reasons, they do vary. But he wants to make sure that throughout the system, there will be zero tolerance for sexual harassment. Uh, he made that clear in his remarks to you on Friday. And, and we're pursuing measures uh, on, on that level. Yes. Yes, what kind of measures? I think Stephen Lewis, uh, whom we all know from his work on AIDS for so many years, uh, recommended that an outside group, that the problem was that a lot of the investigations were doing were done by people who had a close relationship to the accused in every single uh, agency where this popped up, and that had to be some kind of outside uh, in, investigate, you know, investigators. Is that being considered? Well, we'll see what the system as a whole can can agree to. But the Secretary General has brought this to the attention of all of the heads of the agencies, funds, and programs. Uh, as as you know, the Chief Executive's Board meets uh, twice a year, and uh, and he brought this to their attention already as a way of trying to see how we can move forward on this. But uh, the Secretary General and the Secretariat are, are trying to also lead by example, and we're trying to make sure uh, that uh, our efforts uh, to, to have some consistency with how, uh, how the system handles this will be brought across the system. Yes, Edie. Um, on another subject, uh, Farhan, um, as you just read, the UN humanitarian and resident coordinator in Syria and the UN representative in Syria have called for a one-month ceasefire. Mm -hmm. um, why did it, why did that come from them and not from the Secretary General? And does the Secretary General support a one-month ceasefire for humanitarian um, aid deliveries? Uh, yes, of course, the Secretary General does support that. Uh, he hopes that uh, uh, any sort of halt can be brought about on the ground because it is urgently needed. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, it's the officials on the ground and the, the country team on the ground who have most raised these concerns given uh, the sort of deterioration they've seen in places like Afrin, in Idlib, in Raqqa, and elsewhere. And it's for that reason uh, they've uh, made that uh, alarm uh, today. Yes, uh, Dulce. Yeah, so back to the um, case of UN AIDS. So is the goal now to standardize all responses across the UN system, including agencies, uh, to align with one policy? Because it sounds like you're saying everybody has their own policy. Let's see what we can get. Uh, obviously, there's, a, there's a, a range of different ways that different uh, agencies handle it. But yes, we want to see uh, how we can have a, a reasonable standard brought across the system. What, what do you mean, a reasonable standard? Uh, uh, ultimately, we want to see that, that there are procedures put in place in, in each and every area, uh, in each and every agency, that, uh, that can deal effectively with the, the problems of sexual harassment that, that we believe that the system as a whole uh, must face. Yes. Uh, always on Syria, uh, there were some reports yesterday for, of uh, some chemical attacks in Idlib. The U.S. has uh, expressed, expressed their concerns and grave preoccupation on that. What's the reaction from the U.N.? Yes, uh, I mean, we've, we've learned of, of, with the gravest concern of reports of the recent use of chemical weapons in Syria, including in Idlib, uh, the Secretary General once again condemns in the strongest possible terms any use of such weapons for which there can be no justification. He reiterates his call for unity in the Security Council in order to ensure that those responsible for the use of chemical weapons in Syria are identified and held accountable. Yes. Um, a follow up on Syria. You already mentioned Idlib, but I was wondering if you have any reaction to the. There were reports of hospital bombings in Idlib, and also uh, a refugee camp in northern uh, Idlib was targeted by the Kurdish militias. Do you also have a reaction to that? Yes, yeah, so we're, we're aware of the, the reports of shelling in, in Idlib uh, and, and in other places. Uh, regarding 
uh, reports of the shelling of hospitals. Of course, we have uh, taken a stand against any targeting of hospitals or medical facilities. Uh, it's a, a, a major violation of international humanitarian law and must be stopped. Uh, yes, Dulce again. Okay. Uh does the UN have a policy regarding top UN officials using UN symbols like the UN flag on their personal social media accounts? Uh, if they're using it for UN business, that, that's appropriate. Uh, if it's for private business, no, you shouldn't use UN symbols for that. Yes. Sure, I wanted to ask you again about Kenya. Um, there, it seems like, uh, think, whatever, Citizen TV is still closed. Uh, a, a gentleman I'd asked you about before, an opposition figure, David Ndai has had his passport canceled for attending the, the inauguration or self-inauguration of Raul Odinga, and an opposition lawyer, Maguna Maguna, is, uh, has been arrested. And I'm wondering, what is, I know that at an earlier stage, Mr. Abbasanjo was saying, is the UN actually trying to, to, to diffuse what seems to be a mounting tension between the two sides in Kenya? Well, uh, we, we are concerned about any of uh, these uh, reports. Uh, we want uh, once more for all of the Kenyans uh, to maintain a lawful and peaceful social and political environment and, uh, and in recognition of the critical role of security agencies in preventing violence and maintaining law and order, the United Nations urges law enforcement officials to continue to observe the law and respond proportionally in dealing with protests. Right. Well, what about like locking up of these opposition people? It seems to, some people are saying they might lock up Abraham Odinga, which would create a huge outcry. So I'm just wondering, is there an attempt by the UN to sort of... We, we are in touch uh, with, uh, with different officials to relay our various concerns about the situation. Yes. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you one. It's something, yesterday, um, the Patrick Ho, the head of the China Energy Fund Committee here, uh, was denied bail. And in the, in the hearing, basically the prosecution said and the judge said that the, she found weight to be given to the evidence that basically the NGO was a front for bribery to Sam Kutesa and others. So given that how this trial is going, I'm wondering again, Stefan had said that the secretary plays no role in sort of following through and making sure that China Energy Fund Committee can't continue to say it's a, in special consultative status with ECOSOC. I've written to the ECOSOC chair now twice, November 28th and today, but I don't have anything back. Is there any spokesperson for ECOSOC that can at least say what the process is? Uh, there is a spokesperson for the president of the Economic and Social Commission, and I can give you that that uh, contact Cause, afterwards. Cause, uh, Brendan, uh, 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 oh, yeah. Anyways, I, yeah. I've written before that same individual, and there was no response. I'm just guess. I'm wondering what is there. What is the does the Secretary General, given that trial that's now moving forward and what's coming out in it, does he believe it in the same way that he is asserting himself as to agencies on other issues that he should maybe get involved to ensure that there's not a, a named briber saying that they're in consultative status with the UN. Well, UN bodies themselves have been dealing with uh, the problems created by the China Energy Fund Committee in their own ways. But what you're talking about is consultative status that's granted by member states through the Economic and Social Council. And that decision would have to be taken by member states. Have a good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>